Saturday morning, we kick off the Experts Program. That means that Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group, is joining us right now. Good morning, Luis. Good morning, Mark. How are you? Doing pretty good. So, you know, kind of a different year for us this year on this weekend in February because there is no AT&T Pro-Am for us to attend. We can watch it on television, read about yep. it online or in the newspaper, and watch the news reports, but no fans allowed. Yeah, and no AMs. So, it's just the pros out there right now. So, it's a whole a different way of, of doing the tournament, but at least they're getting Getting it off and you know that we can enjoy golf and hopefully it'll be a, a pretty weekend it looks like there's going to be some rain on saturday potentially but uh, who knows mm-hmm. and by the way for the enjoyment or i guess uh, the relief whatever you want to call it of the members of the monterey peninsula country club because there are no amateurs this year their course is not in rotation so actually the pro-am still call it at that it's being mm-hmm. played on the two pebble beach company courses pebble and spyglass it's too bad because that mpcc shore course is such a pretty course. Um, and a friend of mine has a house along one of the fairways. I think it was the seventh. And it's great to just, you know, stand out there and, and watch all these uh, pros and amateurs walk by and shake people's hands and mm-hmm. talk to you and stuff. I, you know, I had a conversation with Bill Murray a few years ago that lasted a good 10 minutes while he was waiting for his uh, partners to do their thing. So it was, it's a lot of fun and I'm hoping it'll comes back next year. Yeah. Well, you know, we can both probably remember when the tournament was played in January. It's gradually moved into to February because of the NFL's Super Bowl schedule. As the NFL playoffs increase and the Super Bowl moves forward a week, the Pro-Am has always moved with it because they've always had kind of a standing invitation to players from both teams and the coaches yeah. from both teams to be able to come and participate in the Pro-Am. So if the, the Super Bowl is on Sunday, then Monday is the day that the pros and the amateurs start arriving at Pebble Beach. Now, the NFL is talking about, and they have to get the players union to agree to this, increasing the regular season to 17 games, shaving yep. two games off of the preseason schedule, and they would expand, by expanding the season by another week, it would push the Super Bowl onto tomorrow, Sunday, you know, the 14th, which would mean that I think the Pro-Am would have to move, because yeah. oh, absolutely, it is the number one TV event on the Sunday after the, the weekend after the Super Bowl, the Pebble Beach Pro-Am is the number one sporting event on TV, they cannot afford to compete with the Super Bowl. It will de- and, and destroy the TV ratings. And I don't think the PGA Tour wants that. No, be like two behemoths colliding. It's right. it's not good for either party. So I'm sure that it, that's exactly what they do. They just move it out another week. And I'm sure CBS would push for the move because CBS has a long-term contract for the Pro-Am. And every few years, they get in the rotation for the Super Bowl. So you would never want a situation where CBS had the Super Bowl and they couldn't air the Pro-Am, and the Pro-Am would end up on the Golf Channel for four days. So I think, uh, and, and the money that, that is paid to the PGA Tour from TV would drop precipitously if they went from CBS to the Golf Channel. So, oh, absolutely. And they can't afford to move the Pro-Am to the week before the Super Bowl because a lot of the reporters, being that media business is so much smaller today than it was years ago, a lot of the same reporters travel to the Super Bowl and then travel to Pebble Beach the next day. So you would wouldn't want to be in a situation where you were the week of the Super Bowl because you're you're still colliding with the Super Bowl, even if you're yep. finishing up on that Sunday. So I think they would have to swap places on the tour schedule with whatever tournament is being played right now on Super Bowl Sunday. And I think it's a tournament in Arizona. So if they were to swap places with it, they could move the Pro-Am to the 21st. And mm-hmm. this year, it would move to the third weekend in February, which actually would probably be better weather-wise, and you'd get a little yep. more daylight in the evening and a little more daylight in the morning for when you have those six-hour rounds. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I guess we'll see what happens. It all depends on what the NFL players vote to do. You know, we don't well, think... Well, we, we shall see. Yeah, but I mean, we, <laughs> we see these things as being completely disconnected, but they all exist in a... They coexist in the universe together. They all have kind mm-hmm. of a symbiotic relationship. Yep. So, hey, let's move on to the topic du jour, and that is someone tried to poison a Florida city by hacking into the water treatment system. This is in Pinellas County, Florida. Now, for those of us who don't know Florida, it's a long, narrow state like California. If we're looking at Florida as a bird's eye view, Lewis, where is Pinellas County? What's the principal city? So it's near Tampa. So it's on the the West Coast. So the Gulf Coast side of uh, Florida, about uh, where Tampa, Orlando is. So a little bit north of the middle of of the state on the the West Coast side of it. And like a lot of things in Florida, it's a, a lot of suburban 
areas out there outside of the urban area of Tampa, Florida. And what happened was that a hacker gained access to the water treatment system last Friday, so a week ago, and tried to increase the levels of sodium hydroxide, which is you know what we commonly refer to as lye, by a hundred times the normal levels. So essentially, they were trying to poison the water and poison the people that would be getting the water by significantly increasing this one component of how the water is treated. Fortunately, an operator noticed the intrusion and was actually watching the hacker as he was breaking into what's called the uh, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, or SCADA. And SCADA is used by pretty much every industrial plant like this to manage pumps and pipes and all, how all this stuff functions. And these SCADA systems are ubiquitous throughout the world, but they're controlled by PC. So, uh, you know, an operator would enter commands into a PC that then would go into the SCADA system and, and get it to do something. And this hacker managed to get control of the control panel, if you will, and was getting ready to poison the water before this uh, operator happened to glance over and, and notice that somebody was doing something remotely on that PC and, and was able to stop it. But it's a scary, scary situation because, like I said, these are the exact same systems that are used universally throughout the country. We use, for example, Pebble Beach uses SCADA systems to manage their uh, wastewater treatment. That's why sometimes you have those accidental flushings of the pipes that go out into the Pacific and these SCADA systems are right. not very secure. So this is a, a huge concern and something that we've been talking about for a long time, that hackers can get into our power grid, into our water treatment systems, wastewater treatment systems, and, and really it's concerning. I understand that Florida Senator Marco Rubio wants this classified as a national security threat and wants to come up with legislation that would basically establish national standards across all 50 states for what type of, I guess, uh, network intrusion software that you have to mm -hmm. have. Lewis, at the same time, though, this begs that question where a lot of people who we all use technology, for the most part, we all believe in it, but a lot of people do hold the opinion that very sensitive technologies like this and really national security systems, when we're talking about the power grid or our water system, that these things should not be connected to the internet. It ought to be like the 1950s. If you need to do <laughs> something to the water system or the power plant, you got to drive down there, go through the security checkpoint. You have to stand in front of the valves and the buttons and the machines and the controls and nobody in the outside world or some guy sitting off in the Ukraine or in a cave in Afghanistan with a laptop, none of those people can ever gain access to these systems because they are completely disconnected. Why can't we do it that way and ensure that they're going to be safe? Uh, well, unfortunately, these systems are so complicated and so complex and, and the plants, you know, the, the actual facilities themselves, it would take hundreds of people to manually manage something like this because it's just so huge and there's so many moving parts to it. And automation has become a significant component of cost savings, right? So imagine if all of a sudden the Calam or, you know, the wastewater people here in, in Monterey had to, or Monterey Salinas had to um, all of a sudden hire a hundred more people or 200 more people and all our costs went up and the price of water goes up. People would be screaming and saying, no, this is wrong. So there's a balance. And I think the SCADA systems can be made more secure. I do agree with uh, Rubio that this is a national security concern. It's something that but you know we have to take seriously. If not, we're going to be victimized one day and find ourselves in an unhappy place. Yeah. So hopefully this is a wake-up call for our public institutions that they need to do a better job of protecting themselves. Did they say what time of the day the incursion was attempted? Was it in the middle of the day? Obviously during yeah. the work shift. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, during the day and the hacker, whoever it was, managed to compromise a, uh, a remote control application called TeamViewer. And it was running on a Windows 7 PC because the plant hadn't upgraded to Windows 10, even though Windows 7 is no longer supported, no, no longer being patched. So in essence, they were just asking for something like this to happen because they were using an unpatched version of TeamViewer and an unpatched version of Windows 7 with known vulnerabilities that the hackers took advantage of. Okay. So had this happened in the middle of the night, maybe when there wasn't anybody in the plant or fewer people and maybe you know less people watching more screens and not catching mm -hmm. it could have been a very, very serious situation. It could have. That level of lie in water could have caused significant damage to people drinking the water, esophageal damage, stomach damage, all sorts of things that would last for, for weeks, if not longer. Right. And who knows what residue of the lie would be left in the pipe system and how long it would take to flush it out of the system. Yep, the absolutely. Wow. Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group, joining us today. And, uh, you know, it, it really speaks 
speaks to the issue of network security. No matter what your business is, you want to make sure that your network is secure from incursions. And the I-Team at the Alvarez Technology Group has the latest technology and methods to ensure that your business stays safe or your home personal computer system as well. So contact Luis Alvarez and the I-Team at AlvarezTG.com. That's the website. At AlvarezTG is the Twitter handle. And Luis, the toll-free number for the I-Team. Give us a call at 866-78-I-Team. That's 866-784-8326. 